as you know, many of the services in Azure they keep changing their names. So this was the old name, but uh, they have renamed it recently. And we'll also look at the open source solution that is Prometheus. So in case you don't want to pay for uh, what's available on Azure and you want to use a fully open source solution, you could also have a look at uh, Prometheus as the other option. So uh, this is what the application we have built so far. It's a simple to do this kind of an application which lists like a series of tech talks and it's built using ASP.NET Core MVC as a front end, uh, .NET Core as back end API and SQL Server 2017 uh, running on Linux and all this they are Docker containers so everything is containerized. In the first part we mainly focused on how to containerize the application, how to ship the code as part of container images. The second one was about uh, stitching all this together using Docker Compose. Uh, this one is kind of an outdated approach nowadays. There are much more better tools. Uh, this is good to start with. And recently I came across a tool called scaffolding. Uh, I also blogged about it on my blog. So that gives you almost like uh, continuous deployment while you are still coding. You don't have to go out of your uh, ID uh, while you are still making the code changes. It can pick up those changes. It can build the images in the background and it can deploy if you have a local, let's say, Kubernetes cluster deployed. All this is uh, like instantaneous. Within seconds, it can make all this work. So, but uh, this was like almost four months back when I didn't know about scaffold. I was using Docker Compose. In the third part, we looked at uh, orchestration uh, using Minikube, which is a single node Kubernetes cluster. So before going full fledged into a multi node cluster and into cloud or on premise environment with Kubernetes, this was a way for us to get everything tested uh, in almost a cluster like scenario. And last part was about doing the actual Kubernetes provisioning. Uh, on Azure, getting the Kubernetes cluster provision right from the beginning, then deploying the complete application using uh, stateful processing with the help of a concept called persistent volume and persistent volume plane. And we also connected to the data source using Operation Studio. So let's start with today's session, and we'll be talking about uh, how do we debug multi container apps when you have multiple containers running. What are the different approaches we can take? So I'll start first with how do we debug the local containers itself. If you're starting and you're having some application, you containerize the image, you build the image, you're about to package and deploy that application. How do you test it locally? Then we will move on to the, container, the cluster solution, which is uh, Kubernetes. And we'll also look at how we can monitor uh, these in the cluster. So let's move on to the demo part. So let's see if we have something running with our Docker. I have uh, about an hour ago there was one image which was started. Let's deploy something which we built uh, as part of Docker Compose initially. So I can do Docker Compose and then give the file name. And I can say up. So the whole stack, all those three containers will be started. And uh, they have uh, the running application. To a new window and let's try the same command again docker ps to see what's running so i've got here four different containers running i can check one of them so let's pick the latest one which is sql and i can look at the uh, let's say the logs of that with the help of docker logs and i can use the name of the container which is sql1 in this case and this will give me the complete 
log of what happened inside that particular container when the SQL Server container started. Same way, I can find the logs of the other images as well. Uh, let's say you don't find enough information in the logs and you want to go inside the container and find out uh, some more details. So uh, the other helpful command is docker inspect, which gives you a lot more information about uh, what the container is doing. So here, if you look at this out, is it visible at the back? Okay. So you have the complete information about uh, the running instance of this particular container. And you can see the status, uh, what is the image from where it is created, uh, what are the environment variables it's using. So all this kind of information is quite helpful when you want to debug, when something goes wrong and you want to find out uh, what the container is doing at the moment. So you can use this approach. So some of this I already showed in the first part when we went kind of deep dive into Docker. So I will not spend too much time on standalone Docker because if you want, you can go back to the video of the first session and you can find more details here. Uh, let's move on to the second part. Now, now let's say you've done these uh, individual testing and now the application is deployed in a cluster. How do you go about identifying uh, what is happening in the cluster? So I have already deployed this application on a case. And one way I can find out about the state of the cluster is looking at the Kubernetes plane. So now I am in a full-fledged cluster mode where the application is running on cloud. So this gives me the complete health of the cluster. So I can find <coughs> the overview. So what is the workload status? How many demons are running? How many deployments are successful? How many pods are running the replica sets? Uh, at the very high level, I can drill down for a specific namespace. So let's say EKS part four. And should refresh. So this is usually the demo effect. I've never seen this work very effectively during the demos. I always have to uh, go and recreate this uh, tunnel connection when the demo is happening. OK, so we can filter the namespace for a particular uh, deployment. And then we can see what happened during that particular deployment. So here, if you see in uh, the namespace, AK is part four, I've got three pods running. I've got uh, two deployments, uh, one for the web, one for the API. And for the database, we had the stateful set. So you get the like big picture looking at this pane. You can go into the details of each one of these. So the logs that we saw for uh, the container can be accessed same way from the logs option here. So you'll see similar logs uh, shown in the web UI. That's one way. The other is you can go into the details of individual pods. And let's say, uh, again, here the logs will take you to the same logs. But you can do uh, exec, which is like you are now logging inside the container. You are like uh, doing a SSH into that particular container. And then you can run some of the commands like listing the directories. So let's say you created a file or you are expecting a file to be present and for some reason that file doesn't exist there. This is one way how you can go into the container and you can start investigating. Can you see the logs over time? Uh, right so from the beginning? Yeah, or like, you know, for a week or so. Like let's say you're monitoring it and you, you see a spike or something. You know, yeah, you're watching out for those. Yes. Uh, across the containers, can you see that and can you go into? Uh, not here, yeah. because this is like the default UI provided by Kubernetes. Got it. 
uh, that's where the next monitoring solution comes in. So that's the next part. So this is using the uh, UI. Uh, and another good part, which I find again useful here is you can have a look at uh, events. Now, in this case, there are no events which happened, but for some containers, you can find that uh, there are a set of events which took place. So maybe we go to the stateful set. Things. Now, in this case, there are no events which have taken place, but if there were some uh, events, you would find them here. Usually, the API should have the event because I'm using a concept called in containers and it creates a set of uh, initial container which populates the initial data and those kind of events should happen uh, should be shown here but they are not visible uh, if it occurred you would be able to see it in the event section so the same information what i have on the ui can be queried using the command line so i can go back to the uh, command line and i can query the status of this cluster so I can use the kubectl commands here. So here I'm getting all the services. And if you see, there are multiple services running, but I don't get any response because this works on the basis of namespaces. So if you don't provide a namespace or one of the filter additional parameter, you will get the default service, which is just the Kubernetes service running. So if you have provided namespace, then you can give this additional parameter of namespace and you can query the services which are running. And uh, like any other CLI, you will have multiple options. Like in this case, I'm saying, give me all the pods which are running, but also include if they are uninitialized. So you might have a state where the pod is getting created and still not fully available to start, but you still want to have a look at that. In this case, I don't have anything uninitialized in the status. Uh, everything is ready and running, but if you had any uninitialized pods, you would be able to see them here. We looked at this. Uh, next is uh, monitoring the cluster using uh, OMS. Now, uh, looking at individual containers, you might get to know what is happening just at one particular container or one service level. When you deploy this into a bigger cluster, when you have, let's say, multiple replicas of the same service running, you might want to have a complete picture of the uh, cluster as well as how are they performing. You might want to have a look at the CPU usage, the uh, memory, uh, how is the workload running on each and every node. So this kind of information you will be able to get through a monitoring solution. And by default, that information is not readily available. You might have to dig here and there in the Kubernetes uh, plane, the dashboard. But Azure provides a solution for us, which is called as the Azure Monitor. And this you need to enable when the cluster is provisioned so if you go to the uh, Azure portal, when I go to my particular AKS cluster, I have the option of enabling this monitoring solution. Uh, this is under preview. So if you look at these two, the metrics and insights, uh, these two uh, monitoring solutions, they are currently under preview. So when you click monitor containers, uh, if it is not already enabled, you will have the option to enable it. I've already enabled it for this particular cluster. And this gives you like the overview of cluster. You can find a dashboard. You can do drill downs by uh, last like 30 minutes, hours. So you have different dimensions, different metrics based on which you can uh, get the state. Uh, you can do 
apart from the cluster at individual nodes, visualization of what is the state. I particularly like this feature, which allows you to drill down at the node level. Then it allows you to look at the container. It uh, goes at the very, very detailed level of information. You can do the same thing for control, uh, controllers and uh, containers as well. And if you are good at querying, if there is uh, somebody who likes to do SQL kind of uh, work, there is also the option of uh, log monitoring. So when you choose logs, you have the option to use the uh, log API provided by Microsoft to query the state. So you can build your own queries here. And you can get the uh, complex so if you want to say yes. If there are multiple instances of uh, SQL, yes. well, from you will you be able to access all of them and actually get the logs? Multiple instances of SQL, in a sense, one SQL, uh, multiple containers. Multiple, multiple uh, SQLs in different containers, like each container. Right? Yes, you'll be able to access yeah. them. So you will have to deploy them as uh, multiple containers and expose them as multiple services. Nice. <clears throat> Okay, so this is uh, quite handy if you want to stick with Azure and if you want like very minimal effort and to get started. Uh, this is one of the most easiest solution I've found so far. Uh, if you don't want to spend money because this, you will have to incur the charges. Uh, it depends on your retention period, how long you want to retain this log information and how much data is getting stored there. Let's say you have got 100 containers. Every container will be producing logs. Every container would be producing that telemetric data. And that needs to be stored somewhere. So you will have to pay for those charges. If you don't want that, you could use a open source solution, which is uh, Prometheus. Uh, has anybody heard about Prometheus? Yes. Sorry. Could we take these into Power BI? Should be possible because this is not something specific to AKS. Uh, the solution is at the Azure level. So if you can query other Azure services, so this should also be possible. Thank you. I haven't tried it though. <laughs> okay. Uh, so anybody has worked with Prometheus or Grafana before? Have you heard about it? Okay. So Prometheus is an uh, open source solution. Uh, which is part of Cloud Native uh, Computing Foundation, CNCF. So if uh, any project is there which is uh, adopted or which is supported by Cloud Native Foundation, it means that they support all these uh, Cloud Native technologies and it has better support as compared to other open source projects. These are bound to work with uh, very well with other Cloud Native technologies. And that's one of the reasons why it is being adopted and supported by the CNCF Foundation. As I said, it's open source. It's very good at handling the time series data. So it has optimal kind of storage and retrieval patterns when it comes to storing time series data. And uh, one good feature Prometheus has is support for alerting. So it's not just doing like monitoring, not like your usual what happened before, it could also look at some of the metrics and it can give you almost near real time alerts. You can configure this. Then there is Grafana. So let's have a look at uh, Prometheus first. So I've deployed Prometheus and Grafana, which are again available as uh, Docker container images. And this is deployed as part of the uh, monitoring workspace or namespace. And it gives me two endpoints, one for Prometheus, one for Grafana. So let's look at Prometheus first. So this is the UI which is provided by Prometheus. If you want to have a look at some of the metrics that Prometheus captures. So let's say we want to see CPU.
you want to have a graphical view. So this is again similar to using the query syntax of uh, monitoring and having a look at what's happening and then building like a small dashboard or a small uh, visualization around the matrix. Uh, better part is the usage of Prometheus here. So instead of doing all this stuff on uh, pure uh, uh, Prometheus queries or matrix, we can use Grafana. Now Grafana, as of yesterday, has support for around 47 data sources. They say, wherever your data is, we can query it. It has uh, 39 different types of panels. So you have, as you can see here, radar, I don't know, uh, maps, then these beautiful visualizations which come built in. And then as an output or dashboarding, it supports various uh, dashboarding tools, more than uh, 1,200 as of now. So some of the most common ones are Elastic and uh, InfluxDB. So let's look at the Grafana dashboard. So here are some metrics it has collected from the deployments that have happened. I can use uh, the quick ranges. So I can say, give me all the deployments that happened in the last seven days for a particular namespace. So I can choose this. I can say for a case. Uh, this is just the deployments. but. There are other things like the capacity planning. And you can see how rich the visualization is here. This is all built using the built-in visualization tools provided by Grafana. And that's one of the reasons why it's quite popular. So how did I build this? I'll show you the code quickly. As I said, this comes as part of uh, Docker images, or they provide Docker images. And uh, the part that I like is, it gives us uh, infrastructure as code capabilities here. So whatever we create is all documented, is all like uh, descriptive in a very descriptive manner. I can define what my dashboard, Grafana dashboard should look like, what are the visualizations I want to have. I have the full control. So it's not like uh, somebody built this and let's say he's not available and you don't know how he built that particular dashboard. You have to wait for that person to come back. You can go back here. You can see what are the components he's using. You can customize it further if you want. This is what I like uh, about Grafana as well as Prometheus. So for Prometheus, I have all the uh, YAML files here. So it's all like what we did earlier in case of normal application development and deployment using the YAML. The same concept is applicable here as well. So we looked at the demo. Uh, what are some of the mistakes or gotchas that I found while developing this application or in general that I find? Uh, when it comes to Docker, uh, one of the most common mistake I personally do is I go on the terminal and say docker run the command, but you realize docker daemon itself is not running. So that's one mistake. The other one is uh, typos. If you go back and look at uh, all this code, it is uh, mainly key value pairs. So usually you will find people making small typos here and there, and you might spend quite a lot of time trying to investigate why you have the, let's say, SQL Server container running, but your API is not able to connect to it. Maybe the service has a name which is not matching the label. So that's one of the common mistakes I see. When it comes to the uh, Kubernetes uh, command line, uh, incorrect context. So usually, uh, you will have like a different context when you have Docker for Mac or Docker for Windows running on your laptop and you connect to the, uh, let's say, cloud cluster or on-premise AKS cluster. 
the context might be different and you might deploy an application into one context and you're trying to access it from the other. It will not work. It's not in sync. Uh, other one is missing namespace or wrong namespace. So if you are using namespaces to logically segregate your clusters, uh, you might miss to have a namespace in one of your application deployment file. And again, the same thing, the service is deployed, it's running. When you look at the dashboard, it says it's running, but when the application tries accessing it, because the namespace is not matching, it will not be able to work together. On the AKS specific things, uh, APIs uh, is sometimes difficult to manage or difficult to remember because uh, nowadays you see most of the softwares they get released quite often and documentation sometimes may not be the most uh, relevant one. So you might find an API which is documented, but it doesn't work with the current version. Uh, the last one I found was a default uh, role-based access enabled for recent versions of AKS. So uh, for almost six to eight months, I use a script. So if you look at my code base, I have a deployment script which or PowerShell script which deploys everything for me. So it takes all the parameters like which subscription I want to use, what is my resource name, uh, resource group name, what is the cluster name and all that. And uh, in one shot, I'm able to provision all these resources. So if you look at this line 35, if I don't have this line in the newer versions, you will find that the cluster is created. When you deploy the application, it doesn't work. It doesn't get deployed because role-based access is by default enabled with the most recent AKS clusters on the chip. So that brings me to the end of this talk. Here are some references. So the demo code is available on GitHub. Uh, there are links I've provided for Kubernetes Playground Azure monitoring solution that I used. Uh, the uh, container monitoring with uh, log analytics. This is another solution where if you're not working with AKS, but you have other container solution like uh, Docker Swarm, and you still want to enable monitoring solution, you can use the third option. Then Prometheus and Grafana, and then I provided a couple of cheat sheets. So whatever commands I was showing you, you can find them readily available in these cheat sheets. For the references, all the slides for uh, the previous four as well as this session would be available on these uh, two links. I usually post them to speaker deck and slide share. And here are the videos from the previous session. So I'll be sharing it anyway from the meetup so you can find it there. So the earlier videos, uh, thanks to Alan and Engineers SG, they are available on Engineers SG website. I've also provided the links to these videos on my blog. So you can find it there. So thank you. Thanks a lot for taking time for this session. Uh, that's the GitHub URL if you want to have a look at the complete source code. Any questions? You can provide some feedback. That would be helpful. There are only like four questions. While I take questions, if you could have the feedback, that would be great. Yes. So, which one is the better option? Or they suggested option? Nowadays, everybody is providing Kubernetes. So, Kubernetes is like the most popular container orchestration platform at the moment. So, you'll find it on on premise as well as cloud. You'll have it on Google Cloud. You'll have it on AWS, Azure. Um, HP private cloud, IBM, wherever you go, you will have support for APIs. Uh, it is based on the open source Kubernetes version. So if you don't want any of this, you can as well go directly to the open source project. You can start it. But the advantage of using a managed service is you get all the support around that. So you have like the whole security, you have this uh, 
monitoring solutions. Now with one click, I can enable monitoring for that Kubernetes cluster. If I don't use these managed services, then I will have to spend that much amount of time effort to build those additional capabilities and that's additional workload for me. So it really depends on where you want to go. I know some people, like one of my ex-colleagues, he would say, I want to start right from the scratch. I don't believe in Google, I don't believe in AWS. I want to know what happens right at the core level. And he built a Kubernetes cluster right from the open source world. As we said, it's uh, available for Windows 36 to Android something. Kubernetes? Uh, yeah, and, uh, can, using Docker. You deploy the Docker. Docker is uh, Windows. You can. You can deploy Docker with the previous version. Uh, you need to enable uh, hypervisor and things like that. With Windows 2016, it comes by default. So you have better integration with Windows 2016. Yes. Okay. Sanjay, do you want to talk about Sure, I can still write the questions. Yeah. He has some announcements for I just have a quick one on your monitoring. I think it's uh, given the uh, facility to power BI, I think it looks like a great solution on power BI. Yeah. <laughs> So really quick uh, for, you know, I'm part of the MISOFT uh, community as well, uh, part of the SQL and Power BI uh, yeah, group. The one thing we want to do is here, as, as uh, Nidesh has walked through stuff, we would like to capture it in Microsoft Teams. Have you guys heard of Microsoft Teams? Right. And then you can actually have a guest account where we are all in one group and we'll have a tab for you know, containers, for example, another one for SQL, etc. So we can keep the conversations contained. Any uploads can be done right to Teams, you know. So, and if you guys have any.